Talking to Death is released weekly, every Wednesday, and brought to you absolutely free. But if you want ad-free listening and exclusive bonuses, subscribe to Tenderfoot Plus at tenderfootplus.com or on Apple Podcasts. Talking to Death is a production of Tenderfoot TV and iHeart Podcasts. Listener discretion is advised. Mikey! Pain. Are you in Burbank? Why do you know that? It's behind you. Oh my! <laughs> that says exactly where you are. Yeah, I'm. I'm trying to be a mentalist. You know. Have you seen that one guy, the Oz, the mentalist? And don't confuse it with Doctor Oz. It's the other Oz, and not not that Oz either. His shit is insane, though. I mean, it's it's super impressive. I th- I assume he's like some kind of magician that has done a ton of practice and. You know, those guys, magic, I don't think magic is real. Maybe it kind of is in like the certain, certain realms. You don't think magic is real? That, I don't that's think. A, what do you mean? Like as if there's a small chance that there's like one or two guys who just have some secret ability who are making cards literally disappear. <laughs> have you heard about the uh, UFO that when you go inside of it, on the outside, it's 40 feet in diameter. And when you go inside, it's the size of a football field. I have heard about that. I saw it on Reddit. Uh, what's the what's the whole thing with that again? It's it's magic. That's well, I mean yeah, that 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 <laughs> is if that's true, it is magic. Yeah, hundred percent. Or is it science that we don't understand yet? Though is the thing. It. I mean, yeah, probably space time. You go back to caveman days and show them how we're even recording this thing with our iPhones and MacBooks. They would think that's magic because it. I mean, it is. What are we talking about? These guys are trying to start fires and we're over here goofing off on 5g lte or whatever now we're back to aliens because that's what we're going to be talking about today you know i made a podcast called high strange and some of you who are listening right now you know that because that's why you're here but it's a eight-part series on just the entire ufo phenomenon and just trying to poke at what the hell's really going on and taking a a real objective approach to it because if you whittle it down something is going on and if it isn't then that's also a story too because there's just too much weird shit that we can't explain yet between you and me we we both believe in ufos right like i mean what's your what's your basic stance here you think i've believed in ufos for a long time i mean the pentagon believes in ufos it's not a secret anymore okay ufos they, you know, we call them uaps now which is a way, way lamer name. You know, UFO had a nice little ring to it. But, you know, yeah, UFOs are obviously real because they're unidentified flying objects. So anything you see in the sky that you can't identify, that's a UFO. But when I say UFOs are obviously real, I mean that there are things in the sky that we've seen that aren't necessarily just weird refractions of light or camera settings or goofy data you know, real physical things or anomalies in the sky that our best pilots and our most advanced military sectors have created entire departments around trying to figure out. And so it makes you wonder, at least, is everyone drinking the sauce or is there something really going on here, right? Or or what is it that is going on is the, is the bigger question, right? Yeah, and it's also like totally possible. Think about, I mean, there's like living microorganisms in your eyebrows right now, right? Like they're burrowing in there. Not they're, mine, bro. Mine are mine no, no, there as a whistle. No, they're in there under a microscope. That's called lice, bro. You should get that checked out. <laughs> it's not. But look at these little white bugs that are crawling on my hair. It's like no, that's lice, bro. They're not thinking about us and what we are and what we're up to. And it could be a similar thing where it's like these things maybe were they also in somebody's... Could be, though. We, we don't know that. Maybe. But, yeah. but we could be in somebody's eyebrow right now and they don't even <laughs> think about us or, and can't see us. Who knows? Would you be pissed if this whole thing, this whole time we're just in some alien's eyebrow? Nah, that's fine. I mean, you can't even be mad about that. It's like that's the coolest eyebrow. So, okay, before we get too too heady on this, our guest today is Jeremy Corbell. He is a renowned journalist, very talented human being, and he's the guy who has been breaking a lot of these viral UFO videos that the most legitimate 
news sources are covering, you know, from the New York Times to Fox to CNN to, you know, you pick your poison. Everyone's covering these stories. And a lot of them, a lot of these stories have been piggybacking off of leaked data, leaked documents, and leaked videos of these weird anomalies in the sky, which is really kind of what helped spark this new age conversation about it. And he's really on the forefront of that. And so he knows a lot. And so I try to press him a little bit here and there for some secrets, <laughs> but also just all in good fun. You know, this is somebody who has a really advanced take on this subject matter, way more than I have. And my entire purpose of making the High Strange podcast really just at its core was to be able to make a enjoyable, fun show that feels investigative and feels like you're learning something and it's a history lesson and scratches at all the unknown elements of our history. A show that anyone could get down with. Just the idea that, hey, we don't know everything yet. And it's okay to question things. It's okay to challenge things. And it's okay to, you know, believe in things that aren't definitively proven in ways that we're used to them being proven. Because everything that's truth, it didn't always start that way. And so I, I think we have a really cool, engaging conversation. But before we get there, I want to also address all the Up and Vanish listeners. Or if you're not an Up and Vanish listener, you should be. Mike and I here and the rest of the team at Tinderfoot, we've been spending a long time, over a year, investigating a missing persons case in the subarctic region of Alaska. And the podcast comes out on the 16th, this Friday, depending on when you hear this. Those of you who want a little sneak peek right now, you can get it. There is a good three minute, two and a half, three minute chunk from episode one, one of my favorite interviews of the show of that episode at the very end of this interview. They don't know what's coming. It's going to be a wild season. What are your thoughts? We're staring down the barrel of it now. See, I've had a couple friends ask me, they're like, is season four going to be good? <laughs> that's their, That's what they're saying? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what are their names again? Uh, you know who it is. Does Christian say that? <laughs> it was Did absolutely he? Christian. <laughs> it's fucking, yeah. Is it going to be good or is this the one time it actually sucks? I'm a, it's like, oh, all right, Christian. Is this picture you just took going to be good? Or you're gonna suck all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, bro. <laughs> Why did I know it was Christian immediately? Because it's a, it's something he would say. 100%. He's like, I don't know. I'm a little dubious about this one. Okay, all right, <laughs> but okay, fair. It's because he worked on it. He helped on it a little bit. I think he's worried. Oh, because he. Oh, I forgot. He did come out there. He came out. I think with he's us. just conflating how intense and honestly shitty that weekend was we had out there mm -hmm. because it was a lot a lot of shit went down that was unplanned and became logistical nightmares and it, it it was like all of a sudden new game plan for everything and we're in a place where we were not really capable of doing things the way we're used to and it was it was tough um yeah and it's it's probably the scariest thing since dead and gone for me that i've worked on so there's that coming. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a moment that's a very long moment, a whole chapter of this new Up and Vanish series that is absolutely the most terrifying thing I've done professionally as an adult ever. No, no doubt. But yeah, um, stay tuned to the very end of this episode for a really good sneak peek of episode one of Up and Vanished that you can only get here and also go listen to the show. And if you haven't heard High Strange or Up and Vanished, that's all good. But I encourage you to go check out those shows. I think that they're really good listens and we put a lot of time and effort into them. And it's really what's afforded us to be able to make this show at all in the first place. And so I think that you'd really find it... Um, very compelling and interesting. I hope. Or if you think it sucks, that's fine. Just don't DM me about it. Just keep it to your fucking self. Uh, anyways, without further ado, Jeremy Corbell on Talking to Death. Oh, 
Yeah, I'm sure you're you're probably crazy busy right now. Yeah, life's always crazy. Oh, I've got 24 hours in a day. We choose how to spend it. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes you got to sleep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> eventually, right? Yeah, eventually. but you run out of energy. Yeah, yeah, that's what I hear. I feel like, I mean, to me, in, in my opinion, you are the goat when it comes to UFO research and being on the pulse of what's happening in that space. Yeah. How did you get? To this point, and why do you want to do this? Okay, so now we're doing a podcast. Oh, <laughs> we're we podcasting oh, right shit. now. Okay, oh my god, <laughs> let me get the seat up. Get okay. your notes ready. Ah, <laughs> I keep my footnotes in my head. Um, well, I see that perspective. I would say that um, there are real goats to this thing. People that have really threw down and and put themselves in situations where they should be admired for it. One would be George Knapp. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm lucky that I've had good mentors, that I'm a good listener when I'm not talking, you know? I didn't know I would be involved with this in this way, at this level, behind the scenes and in front of the scenes. I didn't know that. I was just making movies because I'd never made a movie, but I had a camera. And when I pointed that camera at people, they would start spilling the beans and I'm a patient motherfucker. So I just would sleep on floors like at John Lear's house and shit. And I just wanted to know, do you have any fucking evidence about UFOs? It was like really selfish and simple. Mm -hmm. Of course, in my mind, I was like, well, I'd love to talk with Lazar just to see if what he said was true. Get to know the guy. Mm -hmm. But I had no in, you know, George Knapp evaded me for two years, you know, <laughs> like, right. no in. So, but I realized <laughs> this camera was kind of this passport into people's worlds where they wouldn't normally say it to somebody unless they were holding a camera. And then I was like, well, I might as well make a movie out of it and see if that sparks something. So, so that's really how I started was just pure curiosity, trying to find out for myself if there's anything to this. And then, you know, one thing leads to the next, man. And if you do good work, people want to watch that work. And then people start trusting you because you are trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And I think people started realizing that with Commander David Fravor when he kind of admitted on stage that we'd known each other for a long years and I had never said anything. Right. So people were like, oh, shit, Jeremy can do something that others can't. Mm -hmm. Just keep his fucking mouth shut. Yeah, and, and that's true. And someone says something is confidential. It's not about I've never signed an NDA. It's not about secrecy. It's just like if someone tells me trust. Yeah, don't talk about this. Yeah. You don't talk handshake, about handshake trust. Yeah, that's the foundation of 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 a relationship is that there's trust. And I think you know that word gets spread just like if you're an asshole, that word gets spread. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how I earned the trust and continue to earn it every day from people who want to know the truth about this and have some piece of the information. Yeah. You made a documentary about Bob Lazar, and for those who don't know who that is and what his claims were, yeah. just kind of sum that up for me and yeah. tell me why you were interested in, in learning more about it. Sure. So for your audience that doesn't know, Bob Lazar is the GOAT, right? So, <laughs> the goat. so Bob Lazar is this guy who out of nowhere, like a Scirocco in the desert, he comes forward and says, through George Knapp, my mentor in journalism, he comes forward on the news and says, my name is Bob Lazar. Actually, he didn't say his name at first. He was in silhouette, but he goes on the news and he goes, look, I'm worried about my personal safety. We are reverse engineering alien spacecraft at a place called Area 51, which you haven't heard about, but it's out there in the Nevada desert. And there were nine flying saucers and we're doing our best. And I was part of that program. And now I'm worried about my life. And I, I feel uh, a threat to my personal safety. And that's my story. That's it. Done. And <laughs> The world's like, what the like, fuck whoa. this guy just said? Say that again? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So George Knapp was like, who is this Lazar guy? And his mm -hmm. his news people were like, is this true? And he goes, George, I don't, I don't know, but we're I'm going to find out. All this needs is Worth great, checking, I guess. Worth checking, yeah. <laughs> so then, you know, push come to shove, all these things happen, and the world kind of learns his real identity, Bob Lazar, and very polarizing figure. If people look into the UFO world, like, mm -hmm. can we believe him? Can we not? Does he have a sordid past? Is he a liar? Mm -hmm. It's all these things that people want to know. And I, I wanted to know too. So, because I was 
13 years old and I hear on the radio Bob Lazar's voice and George Knapp interviewing him and that was like my gateway drug. I was like, that's where my curiosity got weaponized. So you, were, like, you, were, you were influenced by that story. I mean, that's a big story. That, yeah. that, that got your curiosity going on it, right? Bam. Had to. Like, it was like an a, atomic bomb because the one thing he said that blew my mind was that, and I see you got a tattoo of a saucer on your arm. I do, I don't yeah. even have a You should get one. I gotta get you're, one. You're overdue then. What the hell? Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, so basically when I heard that, I think like a lot of people, you're like, okay, well, is this possibly true? Because at the time, however, 35, 36, however many years ago, it wasn't accepted like it is now. So you're kind of like, it's like a dirty secret. You can't come out the UFO closet that easy, right? So you're kind of hiding, right? You mean like, like people judging you for saying that you believe in oh, flying dude, saucers? Dude, bro. Sure, yeah. If you were living in that era and you started talking about flying saucers, oh, you're, yeah. you're the crazy Oh, uncle yeah. at dinner. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, we're living in a different time since 2017. 100% different. So here we are, I hear that shit. And I'm like, the one thing that struck me was the way Bob Lazar described the propulsion system. He, so when you have a craft, it's propelled by something. For audiences that don't know about the basics, most things are reactionary propulsion from rockets to roller skates. You push something out the back, you move forward. The thing that Lazar told me that really or said publicly that really struck me is he said this was a non-reactionary propulsion system so you can move through time and space you can move somewhere without pushing something out the back and i'm like what does that mean and i'm thinking as he's talking and he says it's like you push your fist into a bed and you've got a bowling ball on that bed and the bowling ball falls into the divot where you put your fist mm. it's falling into place it's a non-reactionary propulsion system. But why that was so important, what he said, is because if what he said is true, then the distance between stars and galaxies no longer matters. Because the big argument was, of course, there's life out there in the universe. It's homogenous. It's it's everywhere. That, it's too big, right? It's too big. All, so all the smarty pants scientists say, of course, there's extraterrestrial life out there. However, mm -hmm. they ain't coming here. But if you had a propulsion system, that negated the entire dilemma you have of distance, of time and space, then there's no boundary that's stopping contact from other civilizations. So all these things, people see disks in the sky for thousands of years. Well, there's a possibility it could be true. It's the first time I heard it explained in a way that made sense from a point of physics. And I thought, holy shit, if what he's saying is true, if, I big if, if sure, what he's, yeah. at the time, if what he's saying is true, then... Distance doesn't matter. And if that's true, dude, I got to find out. And so that was the thing that sparked me as a kid. But, you know, I was doing jujitsu. I was doing um, my schooling. I, like, didn't really get into it, but it was always there. I always had a fascination with it. And then twist of turn of events, I saw an opportunity to, to learn more about it with that camera that was given to me. For my wedding, you know, mm. they were making a film on my art shows, and I saw what they were doing was more powerful than the art I was doing. You wanted to capture it. Oh, I was like, dude, teach me this stuff. So as they're sure. filming me, I was like, teach me, push the green button. Okay, got it. Got you know, it. Canon yeah. 5D Mark II, got it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's how I got started. But that was the thing. What Bob Lazar said then, and now where we're standing, it is imperative that people try to understand what he meant by that. And and try to figure out for themselves if he is worthy of your trust. Meant by what? The the way the propulsion system worked and what okay, that, right. what that might mean for these um, craft that people are seeing. Because we can't. If not, then we're just applying what we already know how to do today right. in our science with propulsion okay. to something else. Obviously, it would be difficult or impossible for any of the crafts that we have to travel those distances. So we can't do that. I, I see why someone would be like, that. that's not possible. Clearly there, there's something else we have to unlock here. You can't carry the fuel even with reactionary. Yeah. Propulsion. That's not going to, it wouldn't be the efficient way to do it. We're missing something. You, here. you couldn't do it. And couldn't fact. do it. Yeah. Sure, there you, go. And, yeah. you know, there's no, even a solar sail might give you renewable when you're near a star, like the amount of energy to have some sort of reactionary propulsion. But in general, you couldn't do it. And it is a mental dilemma. It's like something we can't get beyond because of the hubris of the of the human spirit. You're like, well, if it doesn't exist and we haven't created it, we're so smart, it should 
We should know. The thing is, this breaks no laws of physics as we know it. Mm -hmm. We just don't have an example of it that we can show everybody. However, the problem is you got Commander Fravor, one of these pilots mm -hmm. that uh, famously chased and tried to engage the Tic Tac mm -hmm. UFO in 2004 off the West Coast, big UFO event. People should hear about Tic Tac UFO. But another thing that he said in Congress when he was just testifying was he says, we don't have the technology that I saw in 2004. We have no ability to make that. We can't even think about trying to make it for another 10 years. And he's kind of laughing about that number because he's in a position to know that. He has a classified job right now. Mm -hmm. They don't have it. Yeah, if he doesn't know it, then who would know that? Well, yeah, you got to be careful the too. List, the, the list gets shorter, yeah. I would imagine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this I'm the guy just saying, who fly one of these things. He, well, he flew uh, you know, F-18, but th the idea that he knows now with his position of work that we don't have this technology. He's one of many that have said this, mm -hmm. but it's important for us to hear there's some credibility in people who are in position to know. Like you can sit behind a keyboard, you can make up a whole bunch of theories about stuff, but a guy who's in position to know, we should give that a little more credit, who has nothing to gain from, from telling us that. So what he said is we don't have it. Now I know that. We haven't had it. I've, you know, privy to conversations and things like that with people for decades about this. We don't have that tech yet, but somebody does. And that's the thing. Who has it? We don't even have to say extraterrestrial. We don't have to say the, the word alien. Like, who has this technology that we are capturing in our skies with multiple sensor systems now? You know, that's, that's the difference. In 2019, when George Knapp and I released all this footage of UFOs caught by these Navy warships that were leaked to us, there's four or five different types of visual data. You've got thermal, infrared, deck footage, radar, bunch of stuff. We are now seeing that other people have these capable craft, whatever they are, wherever they're from. The question is, who has them? So we don't have to like be all weird about it. Let's just find out who has them. Who has them here on Earth? Yeah, who's flying them in our restricted airspace? Mm. Like if we can answer that question, we don't have to be weird about it. Let's just find out who, right? Is wouldn't that pose some sort of security threat if it was being reverse engineered by the military or something? Uh, meaning, are you saying if we? Don't I guess to know? protect their own op operation. Okay, like a black project. Sure, Let, yeah. Let's go down that. So here are mm -hmm. the possibilities, right? Okay. So fact: there have been craft that can outpace, outmaneuver, and outperform what we have. We have that on radar. We have that on thermal. We have that on infrared. We have that testified to by dozens if not hundreds of pilots and, and more so somebody has these machines and the tic tac's one of them right because yeah tic tac would be an anomalous aerial vehicle sure because it was able to move without inertial effect which mm -hmm. means no slowing down when it's making 90 degree turns or shooting off faster than your eyes can see there's no sonic booms, so it has no inertial effect meaning like no sonic booms it can go between space to air and down to right to the surface of the sea in faster, you know, than a second from 90,000 feet or 80,000 feet, but without these common signatures that you'd get. So, so mm -hmm. that the Tic Tac would be an anomalous aerial vehicle that would be classified as a UFO or UAP. And we have a pilot, Commander Fravor, who not only saw it, but a pilot named Commander Chad Underwood, a weapons systems operator who filmed it. Mm -hmm. And there's an extensive reporting on it internally in the DIA and Defense Intelligence Agency. And George Knapp and I actually tried to submit to Congress a hundred and plus page document by the DIA on the Tic Tac. Now, believe me or not, we did try. And there's a reason we couldn't submit it, but <laughs> um, it does exist. So yeah, the Tic Tac would be one. So now you've got these craft that do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. We're all there. UFOs are real. Question is, Who's operating them? Who built them? Where are the factories? Where do they come from? What's the intent? Mm -hmm. These are questions everybody wants answered. I'm saying, let's not even try to answer that yet. Just let's find out who's operating them. Like very simply, is it another nation? Is it us? And we're hiding it because it's a black project. And like you said, national security, you don't want to let your enemies know mm -hmm. what you have. Well, I can dispel that instantaneously. It is not our technology, not the United States of America. How do you know that? So there's a bunch of ways to know that that are very logical and simple. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the most important thing, if we go into whose this might be, Russia, China, US, a technological nation. Mm -hmm. How long have UFOs of this sort, like the Tic Tac, it was shaped like a, like a Tic Tac or a propane tank. How long have we been documenting and seeing those in our skies? Far too long. Yeah. 
right? So that's the fucking issue. I mean, since Roswell or before, really. Before, they yeah. call them fr- flying propane tanks. And you'll see yeah. military pilots tell you what they saw. Now we have video, though. So it's right. different. Yeah, it's different. Right. So first thing to know, UFOs have been around for a long time. I would argue prior to us even having an Air Force or a Pentagon. Mm-hmm. They've been part of the historic record. And they're explained exactly the same way. There's stories that go back, you know, thousands of years, really, yeah. if you go back that far. And you get better and better evidence as you go because now we have some video footage, mm-hmm. right? But you also have different sensor footage, radar. So it's not just Uncle Joe saying that Data now something. that data. you can actually, you know, compare to something. It's data rich now. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it'll get better. That's the thing. It's sure, just going to yeah. get better if stuff keeps coming out, you know? So, so here you are. You already know that UFOs just like we're seeing now, have been seen for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Cool, man. So it's not us, it's not any other technological nation that we're aware of on planet Earth at this time. But why it's not our black projects? Well, there's a few really simple ways to look at that. I'm sure some are. I'm sure some unidentified people are like, yeah, it's a... Sure. Yeah, we're hiding it. Some also might be a balloon that one time, or who knows? Totally are. Yeah, but there's some that don't fit all those descriptors and there's five things to know whether or not they do or not it's the five observables and these are what are those okay so i you know i'm not book smart but like (laughs) you know i'll give you one so instantaneous movement okay the idea of being able to take a 90 degree turn at let's say thirty thousand miles an hour which we have tons of radar tapes in the public realm people can understand that that has happened so that instantaneous L-shaped 90-degree turn without inertial effect, without explosion or crushing, right? If you put a human in there, even the craft itself would basically um, be combust- it would become a big fireball because you can't make those turns without inertia, the basic physical property of inertia. So it's like if you, I don't know the best way to describe it, but- uh, Is it like it's jumping almost? That that's one way maybe it could yeah so basically you get something going let's say thirty thousand mile an hour as mm-hmm. an average and then we have radar of this and it goes whoop whoop and makes an L shape how does it do that without losing speed and without blowing up right so we, it, right yeah. we don't have that tech so back to black projects every person I've talked with that has accidentally come across a black project in the air. And there's there's many, by the way, that I'm in yeah. direct contact with. I think publicly people have talked to me about it on my podcast. Is like Commander Underwood is a good example. There is a strict protocol, so they don't want it to be public. So first of all, black projects, you're not going to be flying right off the coast of California where you're literally tasking fighter pilots to go check that out. You're trying to keep them secret, you know? So this is not a thing they do for safety and it's not a thing they do for privacy. It's a ridiculous idea. Mm -hmm. So the idea of black projects, you do not fly those and get all this attention on them. There's no reason to do that. Additionally, there's protocols. If somebody sees a, a black project, US tech, and they go through those protocols and all these fighter pilots who've ever had that experience, they go through them. They tell you, you've never seen this. I had to sign NDAs. None of that happened with the Tic Tac. None of that. There's way more to the Tic Tac UFO than people understand. I've said it before, but people ain't listening. It wasn't one craft. This was over weeks. There were multiple craft descending from above 80,000 feet down to sea level and docking is the best terminology about 50 feet above the water with an object, a USO, unidentified submerged object. And it was under the water. Mm-hmm. And these things were coming down, dropping faster than uh, one second to drop that 90,000, 80,000 plus feet. Now, the reason we say 80,000 is because the scan volume of the Spy One radar, which is on the ships, it stops at 80,000, which is basically getting near outer space. That's pretty, pretty high. Yeah, it's pretty high. So, so basically what you've got are these machines that are going for over um, two weeks that are doing something, some job, we don't know, and then they're dropping down instantaneously, hovering and docking with this thing under the water. That's what really happened. And that's well documented, and I hope a lot of that comes out. But you just listen to the pilots. They talk about it and some yeah. of the people involved. Yeah. So not black projects. I'm sure some people say, that's a UFO, and it's some cool plane that we have. Mm-hmm. But we wish we had those capabilities. The transmedium, where you can go between space and air and sea without inertial effect, without slowing down. We wish we had these types of craft. We, from what I know, we don't. And, and if we did, Delta should be using that on my flight back to Atlanta today. Oh, man, it'd be <laughs> so know? amazing. I'd need that. We should commercialize <laughs> that. <laughs> well, and, and the thing is, that kind of stuff, 
typically is. So mm-hmm. you, you see a spillover and a fingerprint of technology that we then learn about like 30 years later mm-hmm. that have started to be integrated into our daily lives. Mm-hmm. You do not see that leap, that transitional leap between this tech that is being observed again, for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and what we have today. You don't see that bleed over properly. So somebody has this tech, and the question is, have we been able to exploit it? Have we been able to reverse engineer any part of it? They call it derivative exploitation programs. Mm -hmm. So you might not be able to make the craft. If Let's say the government has some UFOs of unknown origin, which they do. They do? Yeah, they do. Why do you you think that? I know they do. This is not a question. So from where I'm sitting, mm-hmm. I know for a fact that that we have various, I'll say, not only craft, but components of craft that have been uh, fastidiously reverse engineered, you know, if that's the right word. That's a, that's a big I, word. I, I, I like that word. I'm learning that word. I'm trying to use it more. It's a cool it, word. That's a very cool word. So, you know, very um, thoroughly trying to reverse engineer this technology. And, and it doesn't matter. Don't take my word for it. I'm telling you as it is. No, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm sitting here believing you, mm-hmm. but tell me why someone should believe what you're saying right now. Okay, so we, we can do that. We can play that little game of just, belief. Just, just on a simple, just give me one, how do you know that? Right. Okay, so I'm going to get back to that. Okay. But let me, so these craft, right? Let's say we're exploiting them or reverse engineering. Sure. There, there are programs what they're trying to do is not just like make a whole craft because maybe we can't, maybe we don't have the material science, but what they can do is get derivative technologies. So let's say you learn that the medical or sorry, the metallurgy, the composition of the alloys on the, on the surfaces of these craft that they were fabricated and that they were fabricated in a way that create a meta material, something that doesn't you know happen in nature And that there's some result of that that helps it do certain things. And then we can bring that into our society. And to give you one example, like graphene is a great example. It's like a hexagonal pattern of atoms. Mm -hmm. And it's basically like, I think like pencil lead, graphite, graphene. And they use scotch tape and they pulled it up a layer and they realized, holy shit, that's a superconductor. I think that's what you call it. Mm. And they were fabricating these little cubes, and I have two of them, one from China and one from the U.S., and they have different atomic orientations. Some are like eight degrees off of perfect symmetry, these little layers of graphene, and then other ones are like four degrees off of symmetry. Now, physically, when you take these, what the difference is, I can show you this at my house, like you just take one of these cubes and you push it into a block of ice. It immediately transfers the heat from your fingers into the ice, and it'll go into the depth of the ice depending on the orientation of these atoms, and it it gets cold and it stops, but it's like a hot knife through butter initially. Mm. Now, the reason is, that is, I believe they call it a superconductor. It's where it takes the heat and distributes it quickly. The only way it can do that is because of the atomic layering of the graphene. So we have created a metal, a material, that is atomically oriented to do something different in our physical realm. It's a very clear indication of what can be derived from learning about different alloys and what they do. Mm-hmm. So our reverse engineering programs are looking for derivative technologies. So let's say Lockheed Martin, let's say um, Northrop Grumman, let's say BAE or any of these big aerospace defense contractors. Mm-hmm. If they had, I'm telling you they do, but if they had sure. some of these technologies then that's what you'd be looking for is derivative technologies to get a technological advantage and a competitive advantage in business. And then America's like the strongest. We have great defense capabilities. We've got economic power. That's what the secrecy is about. The secrecy is not about the UFOs. It's not about whatever's piloting them. It's about we don't know exactly who's piloting these. Is it one group? Is it two groups? We don't know how they make it, but damned, we're going to find out. And we're first. Gonna keep, find out Yeah, first. we're going to find out first because yeah. we got technological advantage. Then we'll be a step ahead because whoever gets this tech, if it does exist the way we understand it mm-hmm. to in our common realm here, then it's fucking game over. You fucking won. It's pretty powerful stuff. It's like the atomic bomb. Yeah. What was that whole race about? I mean, yeah. It's about supremacy power. and power yeah. and and really trying to stop a war is what they said. Mm-hmm. But it's like when you can demonstrate that and you can use that, then the idea is you can be like, hey, I don't like that policy. We should probably change it. And that's what governments do. That, national security. It is. Now, why should you trust me? Right? Sure. That's what you said. Well, I said, why do you know that? Why do I know? Why that, do you know that yeah. the 
government is in possession of. I, I have direct knowledge of these programs. And so if you were standing where I'm standing, right? Sure. There's certain things that you have the luxury to disbelieve or you know be like maybe on. Sure. The fact that we are reverse engineering a uh, craft of unknown origin, I do not have the luxury of disbelief personally. I'm not asking you to believe anything I say. I'm asking you to be curious. Well, I'm definitely curious. And, well, not you, your audience. Sure. You know, just be smart, be curious. You keep your mind open, but keep your marbles in your head. Mm -hmm. So I'm never asked somebody to believe me. What 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 I do ask is that you don't discount what I say and you look at my past history and record of being correct. Mm. And if you do that, then you take a logical approach to the information which I say. I could give a fuck if you believe me. It's not about belief. <laughs> right. It's either true or not true. It's right. But how do I know? I have direct um, personal knowledge that, and I'm I'm not going to specifically say what, but uh, direct. I am telling you, I have direct personal knowledge that these um, programs exist. Now I don't know to what depth, and I don't know how far they got. Okay. I don't know all of them, and I don't know for sure. You know <laughs> where, what's going on? But with you it. know that that basic fact. I have beyond a shadow of a, a shadow of doubt. I am personally confident that these programs are not only operational, but they have been operational for a long time. And and what 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 brings you there? I'll give a little more because I know it's weird. But so one of the ways that you could be really confident with that is you could have people come and provide you evidence and proof uh, to their own disadvantage. And that you could get a lot of uh, accounts and understanding from direct firsthand witnesses and then how you'd up that confidence is you'd pass those people or information on to agencies that are policing this within our government. Mm -hmm. And you get an affirmation that that information is, is correct, that it's not lies and it's not fictitious. Oh, I don't work for the government, so they won't tell me everything. You know what I mean? Right. But I mean, if I provide somebody in, I'd like, you know, heads up, it, were they a good witness? You know? So <laughs> that's yeah. one way I can get higher confidence. And there's other ways that you can have confidence in that statement. Um. Does that satisfy no, your that's, question? No, that's great. Yeah, because that, that, that's what somebody would ask if... Yeah. Because they're big claims. And it's, I think it's... It's an assertion. Or, I'm more than a claim or, for yeah, me. It's a I'm, big I'm idea. It. It's a, or it's it a, is a big idea. It's a big concept. It's not my fault. Big pill to swallow. And it's not your fault. I'm not taking pills. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. I'm just looking at where the evidence leads me. And I know that might be frustrating. Well, get your boots on the ground and go fucking work. If you want to be as satisfied as me mm -hmm. with that reality, and you got big questions, right. don't read online. Get your fucking phone in your hand. Get your boots on the ground and go find out for yourself. But I will provide as much information as I can, um, and people can take it for whatever they value it at. So, so much has changed in the last, I would say, let's just call it 10 years in the conversation surrounding UAPs, UFOs, extraterrestrials, changed a lot, you know, where we are today in 2024. How so? I just think that the stigma has been loosened up a little bit. Good. I, um, it seems like that. And it seems like the younger generation could give two shits. They're like, oh yeah, we are. We always kind of thought it was real anyways. It's just, it's your grandparents who are holding on to some yeah. idea that it's, that it's a taboo thing or something. Mm -hmm. So I think that just as a society, from my viewpoint, my perspective, that's loosening up and people are more open to the idea that there's a lot more going on out there than we know, which I like that. But I'm just curious in your opinion, where does it go from here? And when does it come to some sort of head? And I, and I don't mean a disclosure moment, because I think whittling it down to one moment is unrealistic. But at what point does it come to a head and we we find something that's just definitive enough to, uh, to shut up a, a debunker and for us to use and apply new technology here today and for it to be just common knowledge? Well, why do you want that? I, I I don't necessarily want that. It's more that if all of these things are true, then why aren't they universally true? And meaning, like, who else would agree with us? Or yeah, why? Because it what is true also is that there are a large number of people who, um, even when presented with strong evidence, will just say that's not real. Why do you, and, and why you do you think they do that? 
Well, I mean, there's a lot of reasons people do that. Not only with UFOs, <laughs> they <laughs> they do that. With, I mean, they did with COVID too. Remember that? Yeah, I remember most yeah, everything. They yeah. do it with whatever they want to, right? It's yeah. like you know, you. Well, look. Um, so we, I, I'm just curious where that comes from because that's how I feel too. So I feel the mm. world has changed, and I feel like, uh, like you, I, I want a moment where we consensus reality can be the same. For everybody, consensus. Yeah, that's what. You, that's, yeah. that's well said. Yeah. It would be so neat, right? Yeah, it might be less fun to study UFOs if everybody already agrees. And I'm like, like, you know, I'm just yeah, saying. It's like we already know that, bro. but I get yeah. that feeling, right? Uh, so at some point, they're going to be like, <laughs> "Oh, we knew it was true the whole way along," and you're like, "Oh yeah, exactly, motherfucker!" It's I've like, been no, for you this didn't. Shit. You did not. It's like your idea now. So Pull up the tweets. No, you didn't. Yeah. So, but you know, we'll, we'll look at it this way, like. um, Skepticism and rational thought is highly valuable in a world where there's a lot of gray area like the UFO thing because we just don't know a lot about UFOs. Right? Sure. Um, debunking is different. That is the intentional obfuscation or um, denial of information to fit towards a predetermined agenda that you want to be true. That's Or worse than that, they're just douchebags that like want to create um, you know, haze where it should be clear. Mm -hmm. on the subject. Yeah. So you got intentional disinformation, which is prolific in this field. And you know, for good reason, you, we just talked about national security. Like if any of that's true, there's good reason why there'd be directed disinformation. And there is. In Absolutely. This field. But you've got like people that are skeptical and I love that. I appreciate that. It's like, hell Science yeah. Science needs that. And keep, keep me, ch you know, fact check me. Let's yeah. do this. We should be checking ourselves. Right. Right. Totally different than yeah, right. debunkers, yeah. right? So that is a corrosive uh, element that is trying to deceive through sleight of hand. And, and that should be fought against. If we're going to spend our time and we're going to try to learn more and get somewhere, mm -hmm. it does no value to um, give audience to people that are blatantly just trying to make you spin your wheels. I got no love and no hate for people like that. They're not on my fucking radar. Their, their names don't even leave my mouth. I don't care. Yeah. They're not who, who I think is important. They don't have an important voice. The people that have an important voice are the people that really want to know the truth and might be highly skeptical and people that need to be reeled in because they're too believery, right? Yeah, and want yeah, to bring yeah. them in. There's those two. Yeah. So there's just like, there's a path forward. Mm -hmm. That's the path that we're taking. People can talk, they can say bullshit, they can attack people. Like we saw with David Grush, um, where people attacked his mental health because he came out and said something about UFOs. Go right. fuck now yourselves. Now he's under the microscope of anything that's ever happened ever. It's nonsense. Yeah. All of this nonsense. The little gossip, the circles, the, oh, we're working for this person, working for them. But all of that is nonsense. What we need to do is bring this into public light. We need to have a rational discussion about it. We need to destigmatize popularize, bring it into pop culture, that it is okay for smart people to have this conversation and the noise and the dogs be barking, all those names you were just putting through your head, none of them matter. Yeah. Who matter are the people that really are looking for the truth, genuinely. Those are the people that matter. And I would looking consider- Looking for the truth is, look, is a good point. Like looking for it. searching for it. Yeah, Not physically. Just judging and yeah, uh, applying. It's like, it, I come from true crime, mm -hmm. most of the stories I've investigated- Great It'd shows. Be, I love your show. Oh, thank yeah. you. Man. Up and like, banished. Yeah, yeah, man. It would be like if there was a suspect and I said, I want it to fit this person. Yeah. And so I, I that's a preconceived thought. And yeah. so I'm making it fit. It'd be like if I saw a UFO and I say, that's a balloon. Now I'm going to make it be a balloon. Yeah. Or I'm going to make it be this or that. So it's, it's got to be more um, objective sometimes, I think, when you're looking at stuff like UFOs. That shit is... On both sides, even on the side of like, okay, it's aliens. Well, we don't know that either. Right, right. right. But so, but I think that's just mental gymnastics that people love doing that stuff. Oh, they love you know? that shit. And uh, people get all wrapped up and he said this and they said this. I've heard some of the most ridiculous... Um, <laughs> Well, it's it's round. It, it must be. It's round and it's yellow. It must be the sun. Like the 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 logic. I, I don't want to even get into some of the debunking bullshit. It's not even worth it. So so basically, if you see throughout someone's history mm -hmm. that they are trying to fit a mold and they're being disingenuous in doing so, they are not honor, honest brokers of of, of information. Mm -hmm. You should turn them off. Yeah, you shouldn't them. debate them. You shouldn't. You should just turn them off. They shouldn't even be worth your time. But if you see somebody who's fighting for the truth and has brought consistently 
the, the, the correct information, you should have a little more faith in if they tell you something new, mm-hmm. right? So that's the way that we have to navigate this world of strange saucer land UFO stuff mm-hmm. is just have this idea that it's going to be complex. It's a briar patch. There's good actors. There's bad actors. Some people are really loud. That doesn't mean you need to listen to them more. Yeah. And everybody should decide for themselves reality. That's the way you should go about it. Remember that uh, Star Trek conference in Vegas a couple of years ago? Yeah, brother. That's when we first met. Yeah. Or um, physically. Yeah. That was awesome. I, uh, uh, my producer, David Mike, Gresh and I. There. So I, I also, I learned that. Is that what you were doing that time? I mean, well, you're, you're, I was talking at the... Well, you were always doing some secret shit, I feel I like. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> yeah, but it was a little tense. Was he in the room were you, when you guys when were you on came the up stage? To us? Oh, yeah. Just, when, ah. you, when you came up to us by the elevator, I introduced you to him. That was him? That was Dave. Big Dave. Yeah, Dave Grush. Oh, my. You're fucking no, man. kidding me. I know, because we were still being protective. Because, look, um, not like, because... Like, when you got off stage, when we went to the elevator, yeah. that was Dave Grush. was there. There's Dave, my buddy next to me. Big guy. Big oh, Dave. my. Yeah. I know, isn't that great? So it's like you look back at the stuff. So world, for right. your audience, let me just break something <laughs> yeah, down. Yeah, please do. Yeah. I've been childhood <laughs> friends with a guy named Eugene Roddenberry, son of Gene Roddenberry, creator of Star Trek. Yeah. So Eugene Roddenberry has been my friend. We did jujitsu together since we were children. Mm-hmm. He was like a, you know, my big brother and uh, my other brother, my actual big brother. They were good friends. So he was it. He was. He's a black belt. You know, from the same group of senseis. Yeah. So we we hung out all the time. So he says to me, "Oh, this UFO thing, come to the Star Trek thing, and uh, do a talk about the real world UFOs." And I'm like, for many years they didn't do it. I'm like, fuck yeah, I want to see it. Yeah. You know? So be awesome. Yeah. So I was like, sure. I don't know anything about Star Trek, unfortunately. So, but whatever <laughs> I, I went, know. it was cool. And so that's when we invited David Grush mm-hmm. because we wanted to. At that time, we were aware. Because he came to me and George first outside of in the intelligence communities, and mm-hmm. he wanted protection, and so we were like, "Cool, we got to get to know you. This is a good chance. It's in Vegas. George will be there." So we had him come, uh, and then we we spent time kind of getting to know each other there. And I mean, he's come to my house and stuff, but that's when we saw you. But I wasn't saying because this guy was always lived in the shadows. He's an intelligence agent. He was not. He's not used to being public, so I wasn't yeah. going to be like, "Hey, buddy, who you? I just met this you." This is the UFO guy I'm talking. You're about to. to hear a lot from him. You know yeah. what I mean? It was, t- per- it was too yeah. early. So, but you know, that was part of that process. And my other buddy, you know, UFO Joe. So he's there yeah, yeah. too. Oh, and yeah. I, I felt bad, like I didn't like overtly say, "Hey, you should pay attention." But he knew that when we're hanging out, mm-hmm. that you know, maybe there's a reason. He's Something a good documentary here. person in his mind mm-hmm. and the work he does online. The, the 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 weird part was we're still figuring it out. And when Dave got back to his agency uh, at work the next day, you know, he got pulled um, out of his agency and basically given a plant and put on probation. And it was like we're like, oh shit! Is the that- next day, yeah, the next morning after he met with you guys. Yeah. On Sunday, it wasn't us. Just for any whistleblowers or sources that are there, it wasn't because of us. But it was like I was mm. really, really disturbed me. So we're, we're trying to Your figure time. out. It was yeah. They were already applying pressure because of his ICIG complaint. Mm. So it wasn't directly because of me and George, and that got totally resolved. They were looking okay. at like his parking and stuff. They were doing anything they could to fuck with him. Gotcha. And here's a guy that's just clean as a whistle. Like you know, sure he has P- had PTSD issues and all that stuff, but he survived it, man. Yeah. And um. So this is a guy they couldn't pin on anything from, and they were trying so hard to fuck with him. And even after that meeting, it really disturbed me and George. We looked into it, and those mechanisms of, of really, to be honest with you, absolutely fucking with him. That's what the me- mechanisms were there for, mm-hmm. because of his ICIG complaint, which is illegal, by the way, yeah. but not that anybody cares about law in, in this field or in these realms that we're talking about. Not a lot, it seems. No, yeah. it's pretty crazy. So mm-hmm. anyway, that was a disturbing thing, and so that's why even more so after that happened, I was like, I want to make sure that we there's no risk to him just knowing me and George. Yeah, right, exactly. Because right? that optically doesn't look good if th- this is already happening. It's not even optics. It's like real concern sure. for people that are putting themselves out there or about to and mm-hmm. are going through a legal process to do so mm-hmm. where yeah. Doesn't harm the United States of America. So I'm happy to report to you that that event was not because 
of the meeting with me and George that that had been something that they were trying to do to mm -hmm. minimize his complaints to the ICIG prior. And I think all of this is accurate. Dave will talk for himself, but yeah. I believe all of this is, is, is accurate the way I'm saying it. Mm -hmm. So we were satisfied at that point, me and George, that, okay, so they're turning the heat up on Dave. We knew they were going to do that. We didn't know they'd be so despicable in the yeah. way that they did it, but that's okay. He's resilient and, and you know, that's what happened. So yeah, he was there. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, shit. God, it hurts me. No, that's actually, it feels like, cool now that that's who that was. And now yeah. I'm like putting his face to it. And I'm like, holy shit, you're totally right. That's who that was. Yeah, because you see him in Congress <laughs> yeah. and you see, yeah. And also, it was there at Congress, too. I know, That's like for, I for know. a blip. That so a that blip. day that I saw you in Vegas, when I didn't know David Gresh was next to you and I shook his hand, um, we had just gotten back from Area 51, not inside, yeah, obviously, yeah. but <laughs> just went to go see to the gate, you know, and we went there in the podcast. And then I saw that you had gone there, too. Um, it's just cool seeing it in person just growing up with the lore around this place what do you, do you think anything still goes on there and in in, yeah. in that realm of things oh totally it's a perfect logistical um you know location mm -hmm. for secret black project work and there are current contracts and there is work that's done out there do i think the nine flying saucers at site four off of papoose lake like bob lazar said is still there i have no idea mm -hmm. um i have talked to individuals and have recorded with them and one day i'll release that where they have gone out to papoose and they have been stopped by armed guard in military or non-military so corporate interest black fatigue mm -hmm. on on the dry lake bed, two people. One went on record with me. I might have the second one on record. Um, so are they still doing work there? Yes. Is it still the same work with UFOs? Don't know. But Area 51 itself is part of a huge Nellis complex where tons of work, like Area 52, tons of stealth work yeah. was done there. So it's a perfect strategic and logistical location for Black Project work. However, there are other locations that are more desirable in a lot of ways that our government currently has. Um, that people don't know about yet. Yeah. New Area 51s that people don't know about yet. New ones. Well, yeah. I mean, obviously you would assume that there's New other facilities places. facilities that things have been moved to. What's crazy, we know we know where where Area 51 is, but we still can't see shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. in a great spot. It's great. It's great. What are your thoughts on the jellyfish UFO? So, you know, I released that. I do. Okay. So, so what are, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are so big after three and a half years of getting that to the point of releasing it. So I don't know that you have enough podcasts to talk about it. But overall, if you're asking me, do I feel confident with what I released to the public that it's worthy of public discourse? 100% and beyond, if there was anything above 100%. How big do you think that is? The physical size of the object? Mm -hmm. It's really hard yeah. To answer that, but it was substantial in size. Um, you know, I would. You want me to give you a guess? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, not twenty feet, not three feet, but in between that. What do you think it really? I mean, it does kind of look like a jellyfish. And if you if you look at the jellyfish emoji in your iPhone, uh, yeah, have you yeah. seen that? It, the blue one. It kind of looks yeah, like yeah, yeah. the UFO. Uh, what do you think the hell? What is going on? Is it like a jetpack? thing is it a yeah i've seen some people uh, what is that, it i mean like looking, yeah. obviously we don't know but yeah. have you tried to fill in the blanks in your mind as to imagine what that would really look like if you saw it up close um so i've talked with people who have seen much more high fidelity on that object and it actually had scales um like armor like armor they call it dragon armor like scales okay metallic you know so my visual of it in my mind is built not just on what is public in the video, but also all the people I've, that I've talked with. But what fascinates me more about it is the response and um, what occurred when that did an incursion on a military base and then how that footage was handled. That is what I'm trying to heal, that divide. I know who and where it is in mm -hmm. official capacity. And I am, as I said, publicly willing to speak with, I don't know about Arrow, but Senate Intelligence Committee for sure, mm. and 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 bring them in direct witnesses and bring them into the loop of exactly who confiscated it that night. Mm. So what you're seeing is a recording on a screen where people live captured it during yes, the someone, event. And then someone recorded it off the screen and then And then took over it, the years, people will pass it around or, or whatever, and mm. somehow it leaked out you know, to me. So the, the deal is, for your audience, the Jellyfish UAP is the last most recent major release that George Knapp and I obtained and put out. 
and it's a whole story behind it, and it is worthy of public debate and knowledge, and I think it's going to prove to be a very important case long-term when it comes to UAP. Do you think it's extraterrestrial? I would have no idea. I don't even know what that means. I mean, just, it, is it one of ours, or do you think- It's not it, ours. Mm. Yeah. So, you, is it like Lockheed Martin's thing? Or? Yeah. Is it our own craft, or is yeah. it- Otherworldly. Well, you know, it's a it's a, actually a great question. I I don't have any way of answering that. Yeah. Um. It doesn't even look like a craft. It doesn't to me. look like it. I can't assign it to anything. But so. what it did, and what I'm aware of, and the response of the base. But I would say that whatever it is, the most important thing is that it's being hidden from you, and and that's the the thing about it. It was being hidden even from the agencies that were dealing with that time period at that base, mm. and that is a problem. So whatever it is, it is identical to what I am aware of filmed through Pantex, which is a military installation or Mm -hmm. nuclear weapons installation in Texas. So that's what really piqued my interest is that I've, it's not the first time I heard of this. John Keel in his book back, Operation Trojan Horse, one of the most common UFOs is jellyfish shaped, Mm. translucent jellyfish shaped. Well, here goes one of those things. Bro, I had to put it out. <laughs> I had to put it out. What are you talking about? Yeah. We're wrapped, man. This has been an uh, absolute blast. Anything you want to leave the audience with is in terms of what to expect from you next mm-hmm. as a uh, documentarian, journalist, and being on the, at the forefront of finding the truth here? Yeah, yeah. I'm head right in the guillotine here. Um, <laughs> uh, so, well, check it out. I think that one of the reasons we were talking was, so there is this to be special, which is uh, called UFO Revolution. And uh, I actually really love it because it really takes people from A to Z with kind of how we got to where we are and, and where we are now with the UFO thing. You got a lot of people that are involved in the production of it. So you get to hear them talk. Um, for me, it was very uncomfortable because it was very personal to me. They really like allowed, uh, I, I allowed a personal experience with the cameras for Into that. your life. Yeah, and just telling people what what what's going on. Yeah, so that's a neat thing. I think people should get up to date and and watch that. It's like totally free. You just click a Tubi link, uh, and then what's coming next? I I never know. Yeah, I never know. Like all cannons are loaded, and we'll see what has to happen. I think we will see more hearings. We'll, we'll hopefully hear from firsthand witnesses. That's what we're all aiming for. So we'll see, but I, I think um, it's going to take everybody kind of fighting to want to know more about this, and from from whatever their vantage is. And I think if people kind of pay less attention to the distractions and really try to focus in on getting to the core consensus reality of this, removing stigma, removing stigma, we can all disagree about stuff. You can disagree about Bob Lazar. You can disagree about the jellyfish UFO. You can disagree about the Tic Tac UFO. You can disagree about the 2019 events. We, we can disagree about everything. Mm-hmm. Which beer we like. Yeah. But we can all agree that there is something that is up. And, and, and it behooves us to try to figure out together what that might be. And that's the only way we're going to advance this topic. And we're all in the same boat. Even if we're fighting amongst each other, we're all in the same boat on it. So I'd, I'd highly encourage everybody throw down their best fucking shot this year to get to the truth about the UFO thing. If if there was nothing up, then we should know that by now. It's a tired story. Certainly something. Right? <laughs> it's, it's like, come on, man. Something we figured out so many other things in these hundred years. Why is this one still nagging at us? It's so because <laughs> there's something going on. Persistent, <laughs> right? It's so persistent. This pesky well, go, yeah. UFO problem is so persistent. Just right there, it's right there, man. Well, yeah, I'm a huge fan of your work, man, and I'm just excited that you know you're out there and you know doing the doing the work, man. Yeah. And I'm just you know looking forward to everything next that you do, man. So Thank I appreciate you, you yeah. being on the show. Not going quietly into the night. That's for sure. This year's going to be fun. Yeah, man. Yeah. I like that attitude too. You got to, you got to just push past the reluctance and just say, fuck this. I'm sure. going to go find out. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Hey man. I appreciate brother. it. Thank Cheers. Bro. All right. Talking to death is a production of Tenderfoot TV and iHeart podcast created and hosted by Payne Lindsay for Tenderfoot TV. Executive producers are Payne Lindsay and Donald Albright. Co-executive producer is Mike Rooney. For iHeart Podcasts, executive producers are Matt Frederick and Alex Williams, with original music by Makeup and Vanity Set. Additional production by Mike Rooney, Dylan Harrington, Sean Nerney, Dayton Cole, and Gustav Wilde for Cohedo. 
Production support by Tracy Kaplan, Mara Davis, and Trevor Young. Mixing and mastering by Cooper Skinner and Dayton Cole. Our cover art was created by Rob Sheridan. Check out our website, talkingtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. And here's an exclusive sneak peek of the brand new season of Up and Vanished. Tune in to Up and Vanished every Friday, starting February 16th for the full episodes. Nome is a hub for 15 surrounding villages over an area the size of Ohio. People escaping come to Nome because it's so far removed. People running away from stuff. Often bad people, people with bad intentions, they can come up into Nome and they can get away with stuff. I was the radiologist at the hospital in Nome. Florence worked at the hospital. She was always showing up to work with bruises and stuff. Bruises. Somebody was abusing her. She would always show up with bruises. I shared all this with the DEA. There's a lot of good people up there, but there's a dark side. You can get into power up there and you just can get away with so much. The people that you can control, people that grew up there, they lived there in Nome, their families are there, their job is there, their kids are there, they can't go anywhere. They can't speak up against these power structures. Too many people are aware of this stuff. If you hear that something's happening, somebody's being hurt or taken advantage of or abused or stolen from, you don't just look the other way. There's three categories that put these people in. There's people that commit a crime. The next category is people that actively help. They didn't actually do the crime, but they actually participate in a cover-up. The third category, they're aware that this person's covering this up, and they're aware that this person did this. And they don't say anything. Thanks for listening to this episode of Talking to Death. This series is released weekly, absolutely free. But if you want ad-free listening and exclusive bonuses, you can subscribe to Tinderfoot Plus on Apple Podcasts or go to tinderfootplus.com.